Hi everyone, welcome back to Adrian's Digital Basement. For today's video, we're gonna take a look at the Commodore 1541 disk drive. What this drive is known for is a couple things. One is known for being very slow, and that has nothing to do with the drive, that's more to do with the interface between the drive and the computer. Something like Jiffy DOS, which is a ROM you put inside the disk drive and a ROM you put inside the computer, speeds up the transfers dramatically. But the second thing this thing is known for is being really hot. The top of the drive near the back has some vents here, and when you leave this drive running for a long time, it gets really, really hot. And if you stack two drives on top of each other, the drive on the second level will bake just from the heat to the bottom one, and then if you turn the top one on, it gets even hotter. Unlike on a lot of other contemporary machines from the early 80s, the 1541 was actually an entire computer inside this drive. There's a 6502 processor, RAM, ROM, and some interface adapters. This thing basically took commands over the serial link to access or read or write from the disk drive and then reported back over the serial line. So one of the reasons why this drive gets so damn hot is because of the internal power supply. There are some linear voltage regulators here that generate the 5 and 12 volt lines needed by the machine. Plus, there's a giant transformer underneath this main board. And all of that combined just turns this thing into a little easy bake oven. So for today's video, I'm going to replace this power supply with something that runs a little bit, well actually a lot cooler. Well before I yank out the power supply, let's take a look at the kilowatt. I'm going to turn this on and we're going to see how much power this draws just sitting idle. So it draws about 12 watts at idle, and for a second there, the drive was spinning when it first turned on, and it was drawing 23 watts. And most likely, most of that energy is being dissipated into this heat sink here, so this is going to be radiating 12 watts of heat all the time. Alright, so the first thing I need to do is take this board out and remove the power supply. With the PCB removed, we can see the source of a lot of the weight of this thing, and it's this giant transformer. Since we're swapping the power supply over, none of this is necessary, so let's remove this. What's neat is removing it leaves the IEC power input, the power switch, and the fuse holder, and we can just reuse these. Okay, so what am I going to use to generate the 5 and 12 volts that this disk drive needs? What I did is I bought this little mini power supply off AliExpress, Up on the top here, it takes the live and the neutral input, and it outputs two voltage rails here for 5 and 12 volts. This is definitely not the highest quality power supply in the world, but it's definitely also not the worst. Over here is the high side, and this is the low side. And if we flip the board over, we'll see that there's actually a decent amount of protection from the high side or the low side. So in the center here is under the transformer, and the distance between the high voltage and the low voltage is actually a decent number of millimeters. It's a bit under a centimeter, but that's a lot better than some of the really cheap power supplies. And the slots they've cut in the board here help high voltage isolation even that much more. I'm going to retain the fuse on this chassis, which will help protect if there's ever any kind of fault inside this power supply. It should hopefully just blow this fuse and protect the drive of the electronics. So I need to figure out where to mount this. I'm going to probably put this down in this corner right here. And I'm going to drill some holes so I can put some standoffs. That means I can reuse these two wires and just connect them right to here and then worry about the low voltage that goes up into the main board. I'll put a connector on that. This drive is following the US convention for wiring where the black wire is the live and the white wire is the neutral. On the new power supply, see it has an L and an N, so that's the live and that's the neutral. So I'm gonna connect those the right way around. This is what I'm gonna be using for standoffs, some of these brass ones. You might find these with cases from other boards. So there I have the standoffs connected, three of them. And that means I'm going to put this here. And I'm glad I tested it because this white wire is a little bit short. I cut it off the transform. I could have given it a little extra length. But I'm going to sort of put this about right here, a little bit of clearance around this. And I will take off the standoffs and just use a Sharpie to mark where I'm going to drill the holes. I drilled two holes. I couldn't really do the third. 
without flipping this thing over and I was a bit too lazy because the drill chuck was hitting this little tab here. So I think this circuit board is small enough that two should be enough. I didn't tap these, but I'm just gonna use a screw because that's steel as well. And I'm just gonna push down and I'm going to tap the hole with the screw. There we go, no issues. The little brass standoffs have the same threads. All right, so we'll put one of the standoffs in the little nut driver. Now that I threaded it, should screw right in, and it does, just like that. I connected this directly to the live and neutral, as you see here, but I don't want to connect this directly to the circuit board. I want to make sure I can unplug it. So I went into my spare parts bin. I found an old power supply, and I cut this Molex connector off there. So I'm going to use this in combination with this, which I think is from an old fan. All right, this is all soldered together. Now there's one thing I also wanted to do before I mount this permanently, is I have some of this plastic card here and I'm gonna cut out a piece and stick that on the bottom here so that if something sticks through the bottom of the case, like the little vents, uh, it won't touch anything on the bottom of this board. This plastic piece came from something I took apart and it's always good just to keep things like this that you might find useful in the future. I punctured a hole through one corner. That way the screw going through into the standoff will hold this steady and won't just fall out. Okay, it's screwed in. When we flip it over and look at the back side, this is that plastic I put there, so that way there's no way someone is gonna poke through and accidentally touch the bottom of the board. I'm just gonna put a zip tie over these power wires just so it, it's a little bit of a strain relief. So what we need to do first is just test this. I'm gonna test that it's five and 12 volts as is correct on here. So we're gonna plug the power cable in and we turn the power switch on. So there's a little red LED that illuminates on this power supply. Okay, and we bring the, bring it with the multimeter in. So the yellow wire here on the left is the 12 volts. So I'll measure that 12.2. And the red wire is the five volts. We'll measure that. 4.97, looking good. Let's give this little power supply more of a stress test. I have some kind of a SCSI drive connected here. Now it does say stiction on it, so this thing doesn't work perfectly. So if it does fry it, I don't really care. And let's see if this powers that up. Awesome, it's showing 28 watts on the kilowatts. 29, 30. And it's gone down to 16 now that it's idle. All right, now we gotta focus on this board. So this is the original AC input that comes from the transformer and it gets rectified right here, passed through probably this capa these capacitors and into these linear voltage regulators. So I'm gonna start by removing these two regulators and the associated heatsink, and then we'll see if we need to remove any of this other stuff. Well, that popped off. Here are the two voltage regulators. Okay, so this is the connector I'm gonna use and I'm gonna connect them directly into the board where those regulators were. This was the five volt regulator on this side, closer to the front of the drive and towards the back of the drive was the 12 volt. Looking at the back, this was the five volt power output, which goes directly into the power rail of these ICs. The ground is right here, it's found on the lugs, these two lugs that were connected to the regulator. These go to the negative voltage rails on all the ICs. And over here, this was the same situation with the 12 volt. The 12 volt output was here. And then these are the ground rails. 
I'm gonna trace out with the multimeter to see if I need to remove any of these components. Okay, so I did a quick inspection and I did remove these two large bolt capacitors. I just cut them off. They're not really needed any longer. This stuff is connected to the power rails, but it should be totally fine. So now I'm just gonna put the connector in here and we should be able to test this drive out. We go lots and lots of solder on those ground pins because those holes are quite big but it should be a nice solid connection i bent the wire over i probably should have just had these wires come up from the bottom side of the board since that's where the power supply is but it's no big deal because with this i'm just going to need to run this through the chassis on the underside so let's just put a couple zip ties on here and we can test this out all right so the way this originally worked was the ac input from the transformer came up came through this hole in the chassis and connected to this now, luckily, the power connector fits through there as well. So I can just reverse that and run this through over to the power connector on the power supply. OK, so I've reconnected all the wires and I've laid it back in the chassis. So power cables connected. Everything is connected. So this is the initial smoke test. If I've made a mistake with the wiring, it's going to blow it up. But let's just do it. Smoke test time. There we go. Power LED came on. Drive spun for a second, all seems normal. And we're running at five watts idle. Let's turn this off and on again. It goes up to 11 watts while the drive is running. All right, very cool, this is working and it's using up a lot less power. Let me screw this thing back together and let's test it on the actual computer. Okay, here is the 1541 with the PSU swap. It's sitting on top of my 1571 stack. Let's go to the standard C64 kernel and I'm gonna put my SID burners disc in. Now this drive originally had a switch to toggle between drive eight and nine and I didn't reconnect the switch. So this will be drive nine right now. So let's load SID burners. So far so good. And we gotta hit run. Yes, thumbs up, and it's working. In case you want to know how heavy the parts were that I removed from the drive, 1.3 kilograms of weight removed. <laughs> Unfortunately, putting the disk drive, even removing those parts on my little scale, doesn't work. This thing can't go that high. It just shows ease. But pick up a 1541 and imagine removing 1.3 kilograms of the weight. It's pretty substantial. Makes the drive far lighter. And from a heat perspective, I didn't take any before measurements and I'm not going to take any scientific after measurements, but the drive has been turned on for about 45 minutes now. And it's just ever so slightly warm out of the vents here. The entire drive, it's just barely warm. Well, so there you have it, 1541 with a little power supply upgrade. Thing weighs so much less now. It's pretty amazing how light this is now with all that extra dead weight. Runs nice and cool, works really well. So if you have a 1541, I totally recommend this particular mod. I hope you enjoyed this video. If you did, I'd appreciate a thumbs up. Definitely put your comments in the comment section below. Subscribe for more videos, and thanks for watching. Take care, bye.